welcome to the African Weekly Roundup, a weekly program here on Holofedi Media every Sunday where I discuss the latest news and events across the African continent. I'm Sudam Hamid, your host and producer here on Holofedi Media. We hope you find this program very informative. Please like, share and for similar content, do subscribe to Holofedi Media. Also, do subscribe to Holofedi Media Group's second channel, known as Holofedi TV, where you are currently watching this program and where you can find other exclusive programs such as Behind the Scenes and Mahahis, among others. And last but not least, do follow myself, Sudam Hamid, Suleiman Hashim, Yasin Abdi in the wide world for the media team and our social media platforms that should appear on the screen any moment. Let's get straight into the news. We kick off in southern Africa where voters head to the polls in the country of Lesotho. A recently founded party led by millionaire diamond magnet Sam Metekene is set to win Sunday's Lesotho parliamentary election having secured enough for a simple majority according to results released by the election commission. By Sunday's afternoon, results from the October 7th vote were in for 49 out of a total of 80 constituencies. The Revolutionary for Prosperity Party, or RFP, formed by Mr. Sam in March, had secured 41 seats, the minimum required to reach a simple majority. The current ruling party, All Basutu Convention, or ABC, which has run the country of 2.14 million people since 2017, was faring badly, with no seats won so far, according to the Commission's statistics. The, Dem the Democratic Congress, or DC, the main opposition party, and member of the coalition government is running a distant second to the RFP in the race, having secured only at least six seats. A victory for the RFP paves the way for a change in government in a southern African nation marred by political upheaval, stalled reforms under the previous government, and widespread exploration of people over political wrangling, corruption, and policy paralysis. RFP has promised to usher in a new era of governance and prosperity in the country by exploiting its natural resources and its commercial competitiveness, drawing from its founders' experience in running business the party has also promised to strengthen the state institutions. Lesotho is a small landlocked mountain country, or kingdom shall I say, that is ring fenced by South African mountain ranges on all sides. It has close ties with its neighbour commercially and has often relied for its military support to quell coups and political unrest. Lesotho's National Assembly comprises a total of 120 seats, of which 80 are subject to first past the post voting system, meaning whoever, whatever individual gets the maximum votes gets then wins the seats, essentially. And the remaining 40 seats are allocated using the the proportional representative system under which voters cast a vote for a party instead of a candidate and the parties assigned its seats in parliament in proportion to the votes won. The election has gone ahead despite a deadlock in parliament on a whole number of constitutional reforms that were meant to be enacted ahead of the vote in order to bring order to Lesotho's fractious politics. The All Basutu Convention or ABC has run the country since 2017 but divisions within the party have given it two prime ministers over that period. In 2020, ABC leader Thomas Tabane stepped down as uh, Prime Minister after being charged with the murder of his ex-wife. He denied any wrongdoing and charges were later dropped. His successor declared a state of emergency in August after lawmakers failed to pass constitutional reforms to amend everything from the role of political parties and the rules on floor crossing in Parliament to the appointment of senior officials and the Prime Minister's role. Now, the declaration of emergency, state of emergency was rejected by the Supreme Court in that country. Now, reforms were meant to take or led to make Lesotho less prone to political lockdown, but this clearly has failed. Lesotho has seen four coups since independence from the United Kingdom, and occasional bouts of unrest have forced South Africa to send in troops to restore order, most recently in 2014. Now over to West Africa, where Burkina Faso said on Saturday that a process to select a transitional president ahead of elections would begin next week, following a major coup that was uh, committed by military officers against a ruling junta, which itself queued the previous government in January of this year. Now, Captain Traore, which headed this coup, was at the head of a core uh, of uh, disgruntled junior officers. But there were rumours just a few days later of discussions among some of the other army generals on potentially replacing him as the face of the coup. Now, demonstrators gathered in the capital of Burkina Faso on Thursday to show support for Traore amid reports of internal divisions within the military. After an hour of protesting, a soldier sought to calm the crowd and the new government denied rumours of a split. Calm has generally returned to the streets of the capital since last Friday's queue and a turbulent weekend that followed. Chiarori graduated an officer from Burkina Faso's George Nemono Military School, a second-tier institution compared to the prestigious uh, Cadiogo Military Academy of which the Niba and others in the elite are alumni. This all comes after Captain Ibrahim Chiarori 
was appointed as president of Burkina Faso on Wednesday. The Sahara nation plunged into re uh, renewed turmoil uh, last weekend when Lieutenant Colonel Paul Henri de Miba, who had seized himself power in January, was toppled by a newly emerged rival, Traore, leading a faction of disgruntled junior officers. It was the latest push in the Sahel region, much of which, like Burkina Faso, is battling a growing Islamist insurgency. Traore has been appointed as head of state, supreme head of the armed forces, according to official statement read out. On national television by spokesman for the ruling junta, um, the Miba fled to Togo following the two-day standoff, which was diffused by religious and community leaders. Now, Burkina Faso is struggling with a seven-year-old jihadist campaign that has claimed thousands of lives, forced nearly two million people to flee their homes, and left more than a third of the country outside of government control. Swelling anger within the armed forces prompted the Miba's coup against the elected president in January. Appointing himself transitional head of the state, the Amoeba had vowed to make security the country's top priority, but after a brief lull, the attacks revived, claiming hundreds of lives. Tensions between uh, ECOWAS and uh, the, the government of Burkina Faso has slightly reduced. Delegates from ECOWAS wrapped up a fact-finding mission Tuesday and held meetings with religious and traditional leaders and Traore himself at the capital. Traore said the ECOWAS visit was to make contact with the new transitional authorities as part of the support that Burkina Faso derived from the region. Speculation has risen that Burkina Faso's new leader may follow other fragile regimes in French-speaking Africa and forge closer ties with Moscow at the expense of France, the region's former colonial power and traditional ally. The dramatic takeover coincided with the violent anti-French protests and the sudden emergence of Russian flags among the demonstrators. On the streets, demonstrators' slogans included France, get out, no to ECOS interference, and long live Rus Russia, Burkina, cooperation. Now, the United States has warned the junta of the risks of allying with Russia, saying that they condemned any attempt to exacerbate the current situation in Burkina Faso. Some of the protesters this week were waving Russian flags, prompting speculation that Burkina's new leader may follow other fragile regimes and form closer ties. Now, some Western analysts say bigger wins of bigger wins of the Cuban Sahel are the jihadists looking to seize power in the region. Now over to Somalia, where Somalia's government announced on Saturday a crackdown on media outlets that published what it deems propaganda for the Islamist militant group Al-Shabaab and warned that offenders would be punished. The move comes as Somalia's armed forces is backed by local militias and international allies await an aggressive counter-offensive against Al-Qaeda affiliates. I want to inform the Somali media and all Somali people in general that we will regard all Al-Shabaab related propaganda coverage, including their terrorist acts and their ideology, as a punishable crimes, said Deputy Information Minister Abdurrahman Yusuf. He continued, the Somali government is totally banning all kinds of coverage relating to the terrorist ideology and acts of intimidation by Al-Shabaab. The audio clips, video clips, photos and messages cannot be, cannot be sent. Yusuf said the government has also launched uh, cyber operations against the terrorist accounts on social media and had disabled more than 40 on platforms such as Facebook and Twitter in the last 48 hours. Other online sources the applications, websites which terrorists use to spread their messages will also be traced and suspended accordingly. The minister added, Yusuf insisted that it was not a question of clamping down on free speech and later told AFP the measures were not affect normal news coverage by Al about Al-Shabaab by journalists in Somalia. Somalia's recently elected president Hassan Sheikh Mahmoud has vowed an all-out war on the jihadists after a string of deadly attacks including a 30-hour hotel siege in the capital Mogadishu in August that killed 21 people. Fighters from the group were ousted from Mogadishu in 2011, but they continued to strike military government as well as civilian targets, often with deadly consequences across the country. Now over to Gambia, where police in Gambia on Saturday announced they were launching an investigation into deaths of dozens of children amid growing concerns over imported medicines. Following the deaths of 66 children, mostly from acute kidney failure, police said in a statement they were putting senior officers on the investigation. The news came a day after President Adama Barrow promised to boost health measures including better quality control over imported medicines amid mounting concern that the imported cough syrups caused the deaths. I assure you that the government will leave no stone unturned to get to the bottom of this incident, Farrow said. On Friday, the World Health Organization on Wednesday issued an alert over four cough and cold syrups made by maiden pharmaceuticals in India over possible links to the deaths. Now over to the other side of Africa, East Africa, where 
Uganda, President Yuari Museveni has apologized to Kenyans over tweets posted by his son that had repeatedly threatened to invade Uganda's East African neighbor. In a series of tweets on Monday and Tuesday, Museveni's son posted provocative messages including proposing the unification of Kenya and Uganda. It wouldn't take us, my army and me, two weeks to capture Nairobi, he wrote, referring on Twitter, referring to Kenya's capital. Union is a must. No honorable man can allow these artificial colonial borders anymore. If we, our generation as men, then these borders must fall, he continued. Now, President Muzefni apologized for his son's comments, saying it was wrong for public officers to meddle in affairs of other nations. I ask our Kenyan brothers and sisters to forgive us for tweets sent by General Muhuzi, former commander of land forces here, regarding the election matters in that great country, Muzefni wrote in a statement released on Wednesday on his official website. His comments drew angry reactions from Kenyans on social media, and his Muzefini son, who is widely regarded as the de facto head of the military and his father's chosen successor, was on Tuesday removed as a commander of Uganda's land forces. It was unclear whether the change was made following the controversial tweet. He was later prompted, promoted from lieutenant general to the rank of full general and will remain a senior presidential advisor for special operations, a Ugandan Ministry of Defense statement announced. Despite his apology, Muzefini justified his son's promotion, saying his son had only erred in his comments and not in his service. Ugandan analysts and opposition leaders have long accused the 78-year-old Muzefini of grooming his son to take over from him. But Muzefini, who has been in power for 36 years, has repeatedly denied doing so. This comes at a time where Uganda is facing increasingly dangerous Ebola outbreak in the country. And finally, over to Djibouti, where Djibouti's military said seven soldiers were killed in a clash with an armed group in East African nation's north region. Now finally over to Djibouti, where Djibouti's military said seven soldiers were killed in a clash with an armed group in the north of the country. In a statement from the Defense Ministry on Saturday, the attack occurred a day earlier at an army base in Garaptissa. The ministry blamed the attack on the armed FRUD militia, referring to a splinter group of the Front of the Restoration and Democracy. Despite the fact that our soldiers defended themselves valiantly, this attack caused the death of seven of our soldiers, wounded four and left six missing, he said in a statement. This gang is well known for its odious and criminal acts of terrorizing and pillaging in remote areas of the country, the defense ministry statement said, adding all efforts were being made to pursue the attackers and find the missing. The FRUD, which largely recruited from the northern Anfar community, launched a rebellion against the government in 1991, saying it wanted to defend Anfar's interests against the Asa tribe, the larger ethnic group in the country. The group later sprinted following a 1994 peace deal, with one group becoming a member of the governing UMP coalition uh, that backs long-serving President Ismail Omar Gele and the other has continued its resistance against the government. Now that's all our top stories here today on the African Weekly Programme. Please tune in next week where we will cover on other top stories in the African continent.